today's readings carefully chosen for the occasion of profession bring into sharp focus three key threads of the, the fabric of our Christian life. The great prophet Isaiah reminds us that God the Creator does not abandon us after creation to a random life, but continues to call us, to form us, to shape us every day. God is an artisan. We are God's tapestry in the world, God's studio. John in his Gospel describes that tapestry. It's a living project or mission. We are called to be people of love, which means to be people of service, putting others first. And John cautions us, it's not easy. Ours is not a do-it-yourself project or pattern of love. Christian love is totally dependent on our remaining immersed in the vine. Separated from God, separated from Jesus, John tells us, we can do nothing. Christian. John the Evangelist leaves us on edge, alert to any tendency in ourselves to think we can go it alone. And then balancing John's portion is the magnificent passage from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, one of the most beautiful pieces of scripture, indeed of all literature ever. A prayer of complete trust that we might come to know and experience and relish the utter fullness of God. So we are a people called and formed in order to love with God's all-embracing, all encompassing embrace. So those three strands stand at the heart of all Christian life. Today we might ask, where does religious life, the, the life of vow consecration, fit within that whole? It's a good question, and there is no one answer to it. But I think one insight is to see religious life as a kind of intensification of the everyday Christian life we all seek to live. In the right of profession, firstly, our common baptism is cited and honoured. All of us here have been consecrated to God at baptism. And then, the desire to deepen or intensify that first consecration is stated as part of what Karen today professes. In fact, many founders and foundresses of orders initially had no intention of setting, of setting up such a group. They simply were going about their ordinary Christian acts of charity, yes, often with extraordinary dedication. But nevertheless, what they did was simply the gospel call to serve. <coughs> then in time, others, friends or acquaintances, wanted to help. And some chose to help not just occasionally, but every day. And thus, regular helping for some became joining, committing. And the origins of an order emerged. The group, 
community of mutual support and shared work. Unified in prayer and in time invigorated with spirituality. For Elizabeth Prout or Mother Mary Joseph of Jesus, she seemed to have a bet on every way possible way there, the foundress of the Sisters of the Cross and Passion, the setting or the emergence of this order was Manchester of the 1850s. Manchester was nicknamed the chimney of the world. The Industrial Revolution, spread of railways, flourishing factories and mills, had certainly put Manchester on the world map. But for the vast majority, and especially the droves of Irish labourers escaping from the famine, the cost of the emerging Manchester was the wretched, downtrodden, disease-infested life. Manchester was the very stuff of Dickinson's social novels. Frederick Engels of Karl Marx and Engels fame, exactly the same age as Elizabeth Prout, visiting Manchester in 1842, aged just 22, asked, what is to become of those populous millions who own nothing, consumed today what they earned yesterday. To that question, Elizabeth Prout provided not a wordy answer, but action. She stepped out, and into that mix, all five feet of her, with sleeves rolled out. And soon others joined her, companions, visiting the sick and the poor, teaching the mill and factory workers, and at times even begging in order to survive. Among those companions were two passionate priests, Fathers Gaudentius Rossi and Ignatius Spencer. No doubt their spiritual well, drawing upon St. Paul of the Cross, the founder of the Pastors Fathers, fitted with the wretched alleyways Elizabeth and her friends were walking. A charism not glorifying suffering, but drawing strength from the passion of Jesus in order to be strong for others. As they endured, endure times of great suffering and injustice for and as yet unseen, or perhaps even unimagined, hope. The three nails of your passionist insignia or sign placed within a heart probably leave most people perplexed. You're not exactly sort of Bob the Builder, but or perhaps you are. But as Christians, we know that Christ's love, the heart part, never bypasses human suffering, but in fact finds its very meaning there. Good Friday and Easter Sunday are one. So what of us today? Where do we fit in? Sometimes the prophets and founders of orders are described as being on the margins or with the marginalised. And in many ways that is of course true. But we could also say that the prophets and the saints are at the centre, not the margins of God's kingdom. Where they stand 
what they say and how they work, their words and deeds are the centre of God's kingdom. They are the gospel at work. The margins of God's kingdom, I tend to think, are a comfortable, cushy habits and places that end up stifling zeal and leave no room for the awkward or the unexpected or the unsavable. Perhaps as a church, the more we plan, we at times muddle the centre and the margins and risk planning ourselves into increasing irrelevance. Karen, today we say to you thank you. Thank you for your courage, for your trust, for your witness. You have been called. You do firmly adhere to Jesus the Bible and to the charism of the Sisters of the Cross and Passion and to the wider Passionist family. And we know for many of us through your blog site that you do already delight in the utter fullness of God. Know that many hearts are with you on this journey. Kia kapa, kia whakapainga koe, e te atua 